Lynn, what do you do these days? These days, I am a professor at the School of Translation and Interpretation at the University of Ottawa mm -hmm. in Canada. I teach at all three levels. We have a professional BA translation program. Uh, we have a research master's and a research doctorate as well. Okay. And so okay. I teach on all three of those programs. Okay. And uh, what kind of translation? Do you teach everything? Or? No, I specialize in technical translation. Okay. I work from French to English. And uh, yeah, technical is specialized primarily. Uh, this year I did give the big general first year introduction to translation mm -hmm. course. Okay. That was kind of interesting. First time in my career that I taught a first year course. So okay. that was quite uh, yeah. exciting in a way. Yeah. Need to get the students all fresh faced, bright eyed, yeah. bushy tailed. So, so Ottawa you've got a full BA and an MA on top of it. And well, a PhD. Indeed. Mm -hmm. The BA is really the professional track program, mm -hmm. and the MA is a research master's. So oh, it's okay. not a professional master's All program. Right. Okay. We have a professional interpreting program. I don't teach on that one, mm -hmm. but we do have a professional okay. uh, conference interpreting master's degree. But our MA in translation mm -hmm. studies is, is very much a research okay. oriented degree. So it's our BA that mm -hmm. leads to the professional. Uh, but I know you more for your work on translation technologies mm -hmm. and corpus. That's yeah, right. So, so on so the on the translation program, I would teach uh, the technical is the translation course that I teach. But I also do teach in terminology language for special okay. purposes. I teach translation technology. Um, I use corpora in almost all of my classes. Yeah. So kind of okay. trying to integrate. That okay, so your research is is really in your teaching. And yes, vice versa. Exactly. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. So let's go back to your mid twenties. Mm. Uh, what were you? Where were you? What were you doing then? In my mid twenties, I was a doctoral student. So I had picked up and moved from Canada to Manchester. I did my PhD in language engineering at the University of Manchester Institute of Science and Technology, oh, you as it was known in the day. Ah, yeah. right. Okay. Yeah. So, so that was, would be with Mona Baker? Uh, no, I was there before Mona. Oh, really? Yes, oh, Mona was in Birmingham. Before Mona. Indeed, Mona was in Birmingham, oh, and right. I went there to work with Juan Sager. Yes, yes, and, of course. Uh, John McNaught. Right. Okay, so that was. So that was in the mid 90s. Juan yeah. Sager, that was early the language to industries and engineering. Yes, so I had kind of made the transition a little bit during my master's. I did a bachelor's in translation, and then in my master's I um, was working with Ingrid Meyer, and uh, Ingrid's uh, husband was actually a professor of computer science, and they did a lot of collaborative work together on what we might now call terminotics. Okay. So kind of applying technology to terminology. So it was kind of in my master's that I got introduced to technology. So your master's then. is in Canada? Yes, in, in translation, where, from Ottawa. Where, from yeah, Ottawa, from so Ottawa. you're really I'm back, you've full, gone back full, full circle. Yep. So do you think it was necessary to, to go to, to England at that time to do the PhD? You know, at the time it was. There is and there still is no PhD in computational linguistics or language engineering in Canada. So my choices okay. were to go okay. down to the States. Uh, Carnegie Mellon had a very good program, mm -hmm. and uh, the UK had a very good program, and then other countries too. Germany was very strong, but I didn't have German, so I was mm -hmm. kind of looking at choosing between the UK and um, the US. But my dad is from Manchester, so it was a kind okay. of an opportunity. So you're going to home, of, sort of. Kind of, yeah, I had never been. Not oh, even right. to visit, but it was still kind of a neat so opportunity to explore my roots. Yeah. Yeah. Right. yeah. Did you still have family there? I have not in Manchester itself, but okay. definitely in the UK, yes. Okay. Yeah. So after the PhD, you decided to go back to Canada? No, you... I had a six year interlude in Dublin. I oh, really? Got a job. Yeah, okay. I right. got a job at Dublin City University. All right. So that was my first uh, teaching position, and I was very fortunate that it, I managed to get it pretty much right out well, of the Well, that's now one of the main centers for translation technology. It is, yeah. But in, so in your at, day? Well, at the time, it had uh, 
two very strong undergraduate programs. One was in translation at the School of Applied Language, and that was my home department. Mm. But I also taught on the uh, Bachelor of Computational Linguistics program, which was a shared program between the School of Applied Language and the School of Computer Applications. So I was really able to kind of bring my two interests together. Okay. And at that time, uh, DCU was sort of in expansion mode. They didn't have a lot of graduate programs, but they were working very hard on building them up. So mm. they've come a long oh, way yeah. in a it's short time. Oh, yeah, yeah. So I was there until 2000. All right. And then I got lured back to Canada, back okay. home, and back to the University of Ottawa. Okay. So, yeah, and, and I've been there ever since now. So. And you've been doing administration then? I did a while in administration, yes. I got uh, cross-appointed to the School of Information Science, and I'm very interested in terminology, and so there's a quite a strong connection between terminology and what we might call knowledge organization, mm -hmm. and uh, also information retrieval, and mm. I'm interested in multilingual information retrieval. So I was cross-appointed to the School of Information Science, which was a newly established department, and they very soon realized that it wasn't fair to take whole bunch of newly appointed professors who didn't know the university and for some of whom it was their first academic appointment and ask one of them to chair the department. Mm. So they said, who could we get that's kind of experienced already and knows enough about this field that, uh, you know, they could make a kind of credible uh, okay. chair for the department. Uh, so I did that for four years. And then I guess I did a reasonable job. I got kind of promoted up to okay. a vice dean position. Right. And I just finished that up at the end of 2016. And then I took a sabbatical. Um, so good. now I'm back in the classroom You're and back, back to in my professor back job. I'm back in the school of translation. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. You Forgive me for asking, but are you a woman in a man's world in that sort of technological side of business? Or is it, is that changing? It's definitely better than it used to yeah, be. Yeah, I was thinking sure. back in the days yeah. of Manchester there. Yeah, it the was, people doing computational linguistics, linguistics were, were men. There were more men than women. Yeah. Um, there certainly were some women. Uh, women tended to come from the language background, mm, and yeah. men tended to come from the computing background. Yeah. And that was sort of how it was. Uh, you had some linguists and some computer uh, specialists. Mm. And now I think you're more likely to get people who are more comfortable in both worlds. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and uh, I think there is better gender balance now, for sure. Um, Although in our translation programs, it's still... It's the other way. <laughs> women, basically. Yeah, yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Finally, yeah. what kind of research do you think we need if you were starting out? Or if you I'm were very research? interested in understanding how technology is affecting the translation profession in the sense of disintermediation. What's happening now that people can access these technologies themselves? Where does that leave the translators, the sort of middleman or middlewoman? Um, can, well, can you repeat that word? Dis disintermediation. Disintermediation. It kind of means chopping out the middleman. So mm -hmm. how can yes. end users go straight to technologies yes. and not uh, consider the value that a professional translator brings to the equation. And I've even noticed that to a certain extent it's happening within the translation field. I feel that translators are kind of cutting out the terminologist middleman. Some of these tools now allow translators to do a much better job of managing their own terminology and so there's less kind of turning to the professional terminologist. So how are tools kind of changing the balance? How are they affecting what used to be considered very professional jobs that mm -hmm. are now kind of considered less professional? Yes. And so what, are, what is the impact that that's so having? So it's not just a cognitive change in the way we process language, it's, it's a sociological exactly. change. Exactly, exactly. So. Soci sociological change is a good way of okay. describing it. So I think there's uh, definitely work to do there in understanding that yes. better and you know what does that mean for us as a profession should we sort of begin educating uh people differently i don't mean educating translators i mean educating the public Every, everybody educating, about the technologies exactly, and what it can about and can't what do. it can and can't do yeah. and about um yeah the risks involved in in this kind of disintermediation process, you know. Uh, there are, however, the technology opens up new kinds of work as well. Mm -hmm. It closes down some avenues, but yeah. surely 
there are new kinds of jobs that are available. Well, we're too. seeing there are certainly uh, jobs in, in the management sector, kind of managing sure. these technologies, yeah. um, managing the contents of them, because many of them still are uh, relying on human translators to produce the kind of content that feeds these machines, if you like. Mm. Um, there's also uh, jobs in dealing with the output of these machines uh, yeah. because yeah. they're not... Uh, oh, there's pre-editing, post-editing, pre post post so It's not all black, that's what I'm trying to say. No, 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 it's, it's not it's, all black, it's, but, yeah. it's, but, uh, but I think what we need is to have a better understanding yeah. of it. And, and I think that will paint it as being less black, too. I don't, I don't think it, it's necessarily bad, but I think it's not well understood. Good. It's so recent that we haven't had time to kind of digest, uh, you know, what some of these changes are that are happening in our industry. So okay. I think there's a lot of scope for learning more about that. Great. Ivanka, thank you very much. Thank you.